Is it going to happen for all of these guys? Yes, they're going to play Major League Baseball again. Is it going to happen at the rates that they wanted at the start of the offseason? At the dollars they wanted? That I'm not sure of. Welcome everyone to this week's edition of Fair Territory. Happy President's Day to all. I'm going to start today by recalling something from my childhood. When I was a young man growing up in New York, I lived on Long Island, and every night on the 10 o'clock news, it was Channel 5, it's Fox now, I don't know what it was then, but every night they would say, it's 10 o'clock, do you know where your children are? Well, I'm going to give you a variation of that today. It's February 19th, you're a Scott Boris free agent, do you know where your contract is? For six of his players, the answer is no, because they don't have those contracts just yet, at least as of the moment that we're taping on Monday morning. I'm talking, of course, about Blake Snell and Jordan Montgomery, about Matt Chapman and Cody Bellinger, about J.D. Martinez and Hyun Jin Ryu. These are six prominent free agents, all unsigned. The big four, of course, are the four that I mentioned right at the start, Snell, Montgomery, Chapman, Bellinger. What we have here is a staring match, and it's an understandable staring match in some ways because, of course, Scott Boris is sitting with these clients. He wants them to get paid, and there are teams in need, and he knows that they are teams in need. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about the Giants. I'm talking about the Cubs. I'm talking about the Blue Jays. I'm talking about the Rangers. I'm talking about the Yankees. All of these teams, and more for that matter, could use one of these guys. Boris knows it, he's holding out. And he knows, with the pitchers in particular, and I've discussed this before, that if he waits, there are going to be injuries. We saw some injuries last week with the Orioles. And if the injuries occur with the right team, guess what? He might get what he wants, just as Josh Hader got what he wanted, non-Boris client, from the Houston Astros after Kendall Graveman got hurt. The problem is, for Boris, that the teams, at least to this point, on February 19th, are not blinking. The Texas Rangers, for one, do not seem to be involved in any of these guys because they can't be. The uncertainty of their local TV revenue has discouraged their owner from getting into the free agent market. I shouldn't say they can't be. Of course they can be, but their owner doesn't want to be. Chris Young saying just the other day, I don't think there are any additions coming to this point. The Rangers all along were thought to be the team for Montgomery. They're not going to be the team for Montgomery. Not happening. And if he was holding out for them and waiting for them to jump, it sure doesn't sound like that's going to happen. The Giants, president of baseball operations, Farhan Zaidi, speaking about the Jorge Soler signing, had a very interesting comment yesterday. And I want to go through that. As he spoke to reporters, Farhan Zaidi basically said, it's a little bit more disruptive to add at this point. And anybody who is a free agent, we've theoretically had three and a half months to figure out a deal. And if it hasn't happened yet, at some point organizationally, you just need to turn the page and focus on the players you have in-house. Now, the Giants have made moves. Lee in center field, Soler DH. They've acquired Robbie Ray. They've done some other things as well. And I wouldn't say they're set. I wouldn't say they should stop. I would say if the price drops on Matt Chapman to a point they find acceptable, you can throw out that quote from Farhan Saidi. But that's where they are right now. The Yankees, Brendan Cuddy and Chris Kirshner wrote about this today in The Athletic. We know the Yankees made an offer to Snell at some point. It was quite a while ago, as we understand it. And we know that they still have interest, according to Brendan Cuddy and Chris Kirshner, in both Snell and Montgomery at what they deem an acceptable price. What we also know, based on what Brendan and Chris wrote, and this is a really telling point, is that the Yankees aren't going to do a short-term deal with either of these guys. The reason is they're at the highest luxury tax level. They get taxed 110% on every dollar that they spend. So if the Yankees sign Blake Snell for one year, $40 million, and again, this is all from the article Brendan and Chris wrote today in The Athletic. If they go one year, $40 million on Snell, that's actually an $84 million hit. And that's not happening, even for the New York Yankees. So all of these teams still in play. The Blue Jays still in play, in theory. 
the Angels still in play in theory, but it hasn't happened. Is it going to happen for all of these guys? Yes, they're going to play Major League Baseball again. Is it going to happen at the rates that they wanted at the start of the offseason? At the dollars they wanted? That I'm not sure of. And the idea that Scott Boris is going to hit on all six of these guys, I'm having a harder time believing it. And I've said this before. It's always dangerous to underestimate Boris. He sometimes pulls things out of seemingly thin air. But with six guys, even with the four guys, it's getting more difficult to believe. So at least one of them might take a deal that at the offseason we would not have projected. Now, because of this delay, because of this endless protracted situation that the game is in, with Scott Boris being right now the biggest name in baseball ahead of Aaron Judge, Mike Trout, anybody else, he's the guy we're all talking about with these players unsigned. Because of that, there has been renewed talk, and I've mentioned it myself, about a signing deadline. And Rob Manfred, talking to reporters last week, mentioned that MLB, and we know this, I've reported it, has offered, or proposed, I should say, a signing deadline numerous times in collective bargaining negotiations. The union is, I would say, vehemently opposed. Boris called a deadline a death line when he was speaking to Evan Drellick of The Athletic. That's a little bit extreme if you want to use words properly, but that's what he said. And what he meant by that is that for players, any restriction on the open market, be it a salary cap, be it a signing deadline, any restriction on the free market at all is something he believes will not work to the player's benefit. I might argue the opposite because of what happened right before the lockout in 2021. You remember that frenzy, that signing frenzy, but... Boris points out, as do others, that if you look at the draft and there's a signing deadline in the draft, what happens is often teams will squeeze players right at the end and it does not benefit players. You can argue it both ways. I would argue that this situation, when we're in the middle of spring, when we have all these guys still out there, is not necessarily ideal for the game. It's not what the focus should be. And yet it is what the focus inevitably is because these are prominent players. These are prominent guys. There's no question about it. Now, as we talk about all this, there was a very interesting spring training story that developed over the last couple of days involving, well, yes, a Scott Boris client, one who signed last year for 11 years, 280 million with the San Diego Padres. I'm talking about Xander Bogarts. Xander Bogarts got that deal because he's a shortstop. Now, I don't know that anyone envisioned him remaining at shortstop for 11 years. And certainly, we all expected at some point he would change positions. Probably wouldn't be to third base with Manny Machado assigned long term, but to the other side of the diamond, either second base or first. Well, they've got a shortstop, Kim, who is a better shortstop than Xander Bogarts. We know that. They had three shortstops last year after they signed Bogarts. We knew that. Four if you want to count Manny, but he was really a third baseman at this point. So they made a move with Bogarts that probably is right for the team because Kim is a better shortstop at this stage of his career than Bogarts is. Probably was last year as well. And I understand it from that perspective. This team is still poorly constructed. It's still a little bit off. I would suggest right now Jake Cronenworth is probably a better second baseman than Xander Bogarts. Xander Bogarts perhaps should be at first. But the Padres aren't going to do that. That's too much to ask of Bogarts, who probably isn't all that thrilled with moving to second in the second year of his contract. Now, Padres fans always are up in arms about how I'm ripping the Padres left and right as if they're the only team I criticize. Well, that's not true for one thing. But the reason I talk about the Padres in this light is because often they do things that just don't seem to make all that much sense. Signing Xander Bogarts for that contract Didn't make all that much sense. Moving him to second base, I actually do think makes sense, but it's disruptive and it leads to a certain uncertainty with him. How's he going to do it second? It's not something I'm sure he welcomes. He is one of the class acts in the game. He's not going to squawk. He's going to go over to second base. He's going to do a good job. But again, it speaks to the Padres kind of weirdness. And for all the questions that we've had about the Padres over the years, about their sustainability, Padres fans don't like hearing this either. They're cutting payroll quite a bit because what they were doing, and granted, the TV contract is part of this, but what they were doing wasn't sustainable. 
So they're in a weird place. They're going to add some more players. I'm quite sure of that. And AJ Preller is maybe the best talent evaluator in the game. But I still say, and the one thing I still question with Preller is his ability to put together a coherent roster, a coherent 26-man roster. The Padres don't have that just yet. Time now for the inside dish. And you guys hear me say this every week. This is the part of the show where I talk about maybe a story I've written, maybe a trend in the game. Maybe I tell a story from earlier in my career. But this week we have a little bit of a different situation, or at least a bit of a different topic. It does involve a story I've written, but the actual subject itself is a little bit unique. And we ran into a situation that certainly was unique in my writing career. It's happened in broadcast, but not in writing. And the situation was this. Wednesday, last Wednesday, was the day pitchers and catchers had their first workout for the Kansas City Royals and for many other teams as well. But I've been tracking, like all national writers and other writers, the Royals offseason, which was quite interesting. They added a bunch of players. And I was looking forward to that day to writing about what they did. Because all offseason, I was hearing that Will Smith, who was one of the first to sign, played an instrumental role in getting some of the others to sign. And that there was kind of a momentum that took place as their offseason went along. And the players were talking to one another and sort of talking each other into coming to the Royals and trying to make them a contender. So my thought was, go to that camp on Wednesday, write a story about the players and that, just how they all were talking with each other, their connections to each other, and how this came together. I interviewed the players in the morning. I believe I interviewed five or six of them. Hunter Renfro wasn't there just yet. And that afternoon, what happened? That afternoon was the Chiefs parade in Kansas City, the mass shooting that took place, the horrible tragedy of that entire day. So this story was supposed to run the next day, right? You go Wednesday, you write the story for Thursday. It's not a hard news story. It's not breaking news. It's not something that has to go. So I wrote the story as all this was going on with the parade, but the whole time I was uneasy about the possibility of running it the next day. And ultimately, I talked to my editor, a guy named Chris Strauss, and I said, hey, you feel like we should hold this? And he said, yes. We ran it by another editor, Emma Spann. She said yes as well. Now, the question then was, okay, when do you run this thing? And a day later, I still didn't feel comfortable about it. And I spoke with Andy McCullough, who worked for the Kansas City Star for several years. And the reason I didn't feel comfortable was it just wouldn't have come off as appropriate to have a story, kind of a happy story about the Royals when a city effectively is in mourning. That was my real concern. That was all of our concerns, right? And he added another concern. He said, hey, you might want to wait till next week because frankly, man, Royals fans aren't even going to want to read this right now. They got other things on their mind. Fair enough. So we decided to hold it really until this week. That was our thought process for a while. Now, I mentioned before that I've been through this in my broadcast career or similar situations, two of them. 2014 World Series, Game 5. That was the night the horrible news broke that Oscar Tavares, the great Cardinals prospect, had died. And there were reports coming out of the Dominican during that game that this had happened. I believe it was a car accident. And obviously, it's a great tragedy. And we're on live doing the World Series game. And the question becomes, when do you report it? We didn't want to report it based on simply a few reports out of the Dominican Republic. We had to confirm it ourselves. We worked to do that. And once we did that, once we had it confirmed, I went on the air, I believe it was the fourth inning, and gave the news. And I was almost crying. I remember this vividly while giving that news. My son was in the ballpark that night in San Francisco. He was about Oscar Tavares' age at the time. And I was just putting two and two together, right? But we handled that, we thought, in a way that was proper from a journalistic standpoint, we waited to confirm. The very next year, game one of the World Series, Royals-Giants, an even stickier situation arose. Edinson Volquez's dad passed away. This happened, I believe, right before the World Series game started, game one. And again, there were reports out of the Dominican and then reports in the United States as well that this was happening. And between innings, I can't remember which one, but between innings, we had a conversation. The broadcasters at the time, it was Joe Buck, 
Tom Verducci and Harold Reynolds, they were the analysts that year. And I was the field reporter. And we were saying to each other, what should we do? And I remember this vividly. Tom said, we have to wait. We cannot report this until Edinson Volquez is out of the game. He was the starting pitcher in game one. We cannot report it till he's out of the game because if he goes back into the clubhouse, and we're talking about this on the air, and we don't know if he knows that his father has passed, and he learns from us that his father has passed, that is not a, a good thing at all. So we held, and we held until he was out of the game. And ultimately, once he was out of the game, Royals officials went to Edison Volquez, and they said, hey, here's what happened. Royals officials then told us, okay, he's been informed. We felt comfortable going with it on the air at that point. We got a lot of heat for that because this was all out there. Why aren't you saying this? This is news. Let's go. It was news, but at the same time, we were thinking of the person. And I am convinced to this day, and I will always be convinced that we did the right thing. Now, getting back to this story, it's a different kind of situation entirely. We're talking about national television versus an article in The Athletic, which is a national outlet, but it's a subscription outlet. It's not drawing 5 million people eyeballs at every moment like a World Series game is. So we decided to hold it. And then on Saturday, the Royals traded for John Schreiber. They, of course, were conducting their baseball business. They had to keep doing that, even with the tragedy back home. They're in Arizona training, but their general manager, J.J. Piccolo, is still doing things. So once they acquired Shriver, at that point, I thought, okay, here's a hook to what I had written. We can go now. And I talked with the editors. I talked with Andy again, Andy McCullough, and we decided, okay, it's appropriate. So these are the kinds of conversations that take place at moments like this. And you guys have heard me say this before. I'm not perfect. At The Athletic, we're not perfect. We occasionally make mistakes. We occasionally print things or I write things that don't come off well. We had one just about a month ago or so with my Wander Franco column, and I own that. That was not a great moment, and it was not a great call by me to write it in the way that I did. I'll say that again. But for the most part, when we're trying to make these decisions, we take it really seriously. I've always said that too. And in this case, we did do the right thing, in my opinion, to run that story the day after the shootings. That would have been horrible. So that's an inside look at the way that story came about. It actually did run yesterday. Some people had the usual reactions to it. Ah, the Royals, they can spend all the money they want. They're not any good. Or the Royals are in the AL Central. They spent some money. Who knows? Maybe they'll do something big this year. There's always a surprise team, right? And I don't know that it will be the Royals. They're coming off 56 wins. It would be a pretty big jump. But at least they are trying. And I know the new stadium is part of that. They're trying to get a new stadium and trying to convince the public to vote for one. It all figures in. But they've had an interesting offseason. That was the original idea of the column. We finally went with it yesterday. Time now for the Dude and Dork of the Week. The Dude of the Week, I'm proud to say, I'm honored to say, I'm excited to say, is a dudette. It's Jenny Kavnar, the first woman to be a primary play-by-play -play person for a major league team. Jenny, of course, hired by the Oakland A's last week. Dare I say, it's the best move the A's have made all offseason. And first, before I start talking about Jenny a little more deeply, I want to say one thing about women in baseball media, women in sports media in general. They have it tougher. They have to earn the respect of the players, just like the guys do, but it's a tougher road for many of them, most of them, more difficult. No question about that. And all the blowback that guys get on social media, the women get it tenfold, maybe even more so than that. So all of the women, and there are some great women covering Major League Baseball, both on the print and broadcast side, skilled journalists, excellent on TV, outstanding. But all of them face a more difficult climb. Now, Jenny is special for so many reasons. And I'm going to tell you a story about the first time I met her. And the first time I met her, I believe, was at the 2014 Winter Meetings in San Diego. Tracy Ringlesby, longtime Rockies writer, friend of mine, might have been working at Fox at the time with me. I can't remember. But Tracy said, hey, Jenny Kavnar, she is the person who does the Rockies pre and post game show. Would you do an interview with her? She's a friend of mine. She's really good. 
and she needs two minutes of your time just to talk about the Rockies or whatever. I said, of course, no problem. I do these things all the time. Well, Jenny Kavanaugh interviewed me and I was blown away. I was blown away by her knowledge, by how quick she was, by how good she was on TV, better on camera than I was. And I could not believe this person who I did not know anything about before was of this quality, was so good. So of course, at that point, I remember Jenny. She's a very friendly person. We became friends. And again, I am so thrilled for her. She is going to do a tremendous job. She is by far and away due to the week. Dork of the week, obviously it's not going to be as positive a commentary. We have a couple of candidates this week. One, let's start with the commissioner. The commissioner of baseball, Rob Manfred. Now his most famous tone deaf comment, of course, regards calling the World Series trophy a piece of metal. He had a comment at his news conference last week that wasn't quite that bad, but it wasn't great. I want to read you the comment. It concerns, yes, the Oakland A's. And he was asked about the A's leaving Oakland for Las Vegas and what their fans should think. First of all, we do have a major league team in the Bay Area, Manfred said. It's not like there is not an available option. The Giants obviously still play there. Well, yes, they do. But if you're an A's fan, most likely you're not particularly fond of the Giants. If the Yankees left New York, do you think all of the Yankees fans would start rooting for the Mets? If the Dodgers left LA, and none of these things are possible. I'm just throwing out hypotheticals. The Dodgers left LA. Are their fans going to start rooting for the Angels? Well, no, that's not how it works. So yeah, there's an available option for A's fans, but the option they want is leaving for Las Vegas. So that's Rob Manfred, candidate for Dork of the Week, but I'm not going to give it to him this week. I'm going to give it to the Washington Nationals for this ongoing, absurd Steven Strasburg saga. Now, let me bring you up to date here. The Nationals want Strasburg at spring training. He hasn't pitched since June of 2022. He is physically unable to pitch. He can't do it anymore physically. He has nerve damage, all kinds of issues. Now, he signed. He signed a seven-year, $245 million free agent contract represented by Scott Boris, 2019 winter meetings, I believe. And he has three more years left on that contract at $35 million per year. He also has a bunch of deferred money coming, $80 million from 2027 to 2029. He's not going to retire because then he has to forfeit salary. Players don't do that. But the Nationals somehow believe he should come to camp to coach and mentor their players. He goes, my golly, he's under contract. Well, yeah, he's under contract. Steven Strasburg, not the ideal guy to coach and mentor. He's kind of an introvert. So I'm sure it's something he does not want to do. So let's go back in time here. The Nationals are the ones who signed Steven Strasburg to this contract, knowing of his injury history. The Nationals are the ones who declined to purchase insurance on Steven Strasburg's contract. Why? because the premiums would have been too high because of his injury history. And yet the Nationals are seemingly shocked that this didn't turn out maybe the way they wanted. And they want more deferrals. They want them to restructure. Well, maybe Strasburg will end up doing that. We don't know what exactly the Nationals are looking for here, how far they want it to defer, what the interest rates will be. But my gosh, why are they picking a fight with this guy? Britt Giroli had a good column about this in The Athletic. Read it. Nationals dorks of the week for this whole Strasburg situation. All right, here we go with Grilling Ken. Let's get to your questions. The first one comes from Tommy Muses. Tommy asks, do you think Hal and Cashman will spend money on another starting pitcher before opening day? We talked about this a little bit in the first segment and how the Yankees, while they still have interest in Montgomery and Snell, they're in a difficult luxury tax situation and the deal would probably have to be over a longer term. They're not gonna do a one-year deal and then get taxed at a 110% rate and pay essentially more than double for that one year. Not gonna happen. So will they do it? The best guess is no. There are good reports coming out on Carlos Rodon, on Nestor Cortez Jr. It seems like they're in a good place physically. Doesn't mean they will be in two weeks. Doesn't mean they will be in two months. But unless the Yankees get one of those guys at what they believe is an acceptable rate, they're not going to do it. And what will be an acceptable rate for those guys in their minds? I believe Snell and Montgomery ultimately probably will do better. All right, 
let's go to the next question now. This one comes from Ike Gordon. Ike asks, who is on the list to replace Manfred after he steps down? Great question by Ike. Great topic. And Evan Drellick wrote a great article in The Athletic today dealing with some of the names or listing some of the names. And they included some people who are now in the commissioner's office, Dan Hallam, the deputy commissioner, Noah Garden, who is kind of the head of the broadcast arm, Morgan Sword, Chris Maranek. These are all people in the commissioner's office who would be internal candidates. And then he listed some other candidates, some in baseball, Theo Epstein, prominent among them. And he is a guy whose name will come up. Sam Kennedy, who is Theo's best friend, who is the president of the Red Sox. He's someone you hear mentioned. And then he raised the possibility, Evan did, of outside candidates, candidates from outside the baseball world. Now, there hasn't been a commissioner who was a candidate from outside the baseball world since before Bud Selig, and that was Bart Giamatti. They like their own, the owners do. And I would expect that they're going to go with someone they're familiar with. But as Evan points out, five years away is a long time away. And who knows what might happen over the next five years with collective bargaining, with television revenue, with the sport itself. There's no way to predict it. So it might come to a point where they prefer, the major league owners do, an outside perspective, a business perspective. And Casey Wasserman, the head of the Wasserman Media Agency, was one of the people Evan listed. He is one of the guys running the Olympic Committee for Los Angeles. And if you remember, they went to Peter Uberoff, who was a Los Angeles Olympics person, and they named him commissioner. And he was from the outside. And perhaps Casey Wasserman will offer the same kind of insight that Uberoth did. Uberoth wasn't a great commissioner. Collusion happened under him, but you get my idea. So again, five years, long way away. There'll be a ton of candidates, but it's really impossible to predict who will be next in line. All right, next question. From Rashad Von Stan, Rashad asks, what's the deal with Gary Sanchez and the Brewers? We got a number of questions along these lines and they're entirely fair. Gary Sanchez reportedly reached agreement with the Brewers on a one-year, $7 million free agent contract, February 7th. That was 12 days ago. That deal, like all of these deals, when you see how we write about them, was pending a physical. When a situation goes on for this long, when a guy's deal is not official for this long, there is clearly a problem with the physical. I don't know what the problem is. Everyone's going to be hush-hush about this because... If it gets out that Gary Sanchez has problem X and he flunked the physical, it damages him in the market. So no one wants to talk about it. Actually, there could be a grievance if the Brewers came public and said, hey, no, Gary Sanchez, he's not going to be our guy because he's got this. What I expect will happen as long as this injury is not too serious is perhaps what happened with James Paxton and the Dodgers. If you remember, Paxton originally agreed on an $11 million one-year contract. It was restructured to seven after some physical questions emerged in his examination. And they just restructured it, built some incentives in so he could get to 11. And that was that. I would expect the same thing happens with Sanchez, but that is the holdup, that there's something with the physical. There's no other logical conclusion. It's not that he's not in the country or anything like that. When it goes on for 12 days, it's the physical. Final question comes from casual fan at Le Casual Fan. I like that. The casual fan asks, odds of you doing a guest appearance during a Savannah Banana game? Casual fan, I will answer this question like this. I am here to serve. If my schedule allows and the Savannah Bananas honor me with a request to appear, I will do my absolute best to show up. Now, I don't know that I'm capable of one of their fancy dances. But whatever those guys want, if I can do it, I'll certainly do it. Like I said, here to serve. I want to thank everyone for listening, everyone for watching. You know where to find us. YouTube, Apple, Spotify. Like, subscribe. We're Fair Territory. We're airing every Monday. Join us. We'll be back next week. Place your first bet MGM Sportsbook wager through the app of at least five bucks. You will receive $150 instantly in additional winnings regardless of your wager's outcome. Got to use the bonus code FOUL, F-O-U-L, when you download the app and you're a new customer. Sign up and deposit at least five bucks into the account. Place a wager in the amount of at least five bucks at standard odds price. Once you place that bet, you'll receive $150 in bonus bets regardless of the outcome of your wager. Gambling problem or concern? Call 1-800-GAMBLING. 
Hey everybody, be sure to like and subscribe for more content. Fair Territory airs each week, and we'd love for you to become a part of our community. Here's another video you might enjoy. See you next time.